Over summer, I'm doing a sort of special series where I'm interviewing and talking to some people from everything from an expert on anxiety to a principal from Wales who is doing some really interesting things with play and um, children with pathological demand avoidance. So I'm just getting a hold of like eclectic people on to talk. Um, I find these really interesting conversations and I'm calling them sort of summer conversations. So make sure you subscribe because if you're away over summer or not looking at your emails, then you want to make sure when a new episode drops, they're just an opportunity to be a little bit eclectic and not necessarily for teachers thinking about the classrooms or parents about parenting. I mean, they're just sort of, um, I don't know, just some interesting people that I've come across who have doing some interesting work. And I thought, well, why don't we mix it up over January and um, over summer? And um, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of the podcasts. The other thing I would really love you to do is just take a moment to rate my podcast. You don't have to leave a comment. Just give it a star rating. Just that helps other people find the podcast. So otherwise they don't know about it. And if you feel inclined, share an episode that you've enjoyed. Share one of your favorite episodes of the season or the the season. We don't do seasons, but favorite episode that you've enjoyed this year. Because remember, the more we share, the more we can make a difference. Hi everyone, welcome to the Sue Larky podcast. As I always say, you have to embrace difference to make a difference. Let's dive into today's podcast. I am super excited to have Dr. Russell Kennedy on today on the podcast. He's a medical doctor, a neuroscientist with deep roots in the developmental psychology. His award-winning book, Anxiety Rx, I highly recommend as a read this summer if you're in Australia. It is top rated on Amazon, fantastic reviews, and he is going to be sharing with us some tips, um, solutions, but also getting us to think differently about anxiety today. Uh, He's no stranger to anxiety himself as he's suffered from chronic worry and uh, health anxiety for decades and tried lots of different things, but his book's about looking at anxiety differently. So welcome. Thanks, Sue. It's nice to be here. You know, I guess we got our time zones. We got our time zones different. You and Oz and me in the West Coast of Canada. So we managed to hook it up, link it up. Good. It's fantastic. I was saying it was no irony that we were, but I was getting anxious about the time zones. Yeah. <laughs> um, so t- tell me about why you wrote the book. I guess I wrote the book because I just felt that the traditional therapies for anxiety weren't very effective. You know, I've, I've had anxiety since I was 20. I'm turning 62 in a week. And uh, it's just like, I, I dealt with anxiety for so long. I went through traditional psychotherapy, even even some EMDR and all, which, and these things helped a little bit, but they didn't really help me really heal. So uh, what I did was I got really desperate about my own situation because nothing was really helping me in the traditional and even the non-traditional stuff. So I did um, psychedelics. I did LSD and ayahuasca and psilocybin because I was desperate. You know, I was, you know, my anxiety was so bad. I was, you know, suicidal at points. I didn't want to live if I had to just keep living in a 10 hour panic attack every single day. So what I found uh, on LSD was that what I called anxiety of my mind was actually the state of alarm held in my body, uh, particularly in my solar plexus from, you know, 20 years of growing up with a father with schizophrenia and bipolar illness, you know, so a lot of the trauma of that was held in my body. And that was the engine that was the generator of the anxiety of my mind. So I was, I was looking to try and fix the thoughts but the thoughts weren't the real problem. That's what I found. The thoughts are just a byproduct of this old trauma that's still held in my body and still being read by my mind. And through a process called interoception, where the mind is constantly reading the body, it reads the alarm, it reads the old trauma that hasn't been resolved in your body. And then it has to make up a story that's completely consistent with that old feeling of alarm, that energy of pain that was never resolved when you were a child. So what it does is the mind reads that negative energy and it makes negative thoughts to be consistent with that negative energy, which winds up being worries. And then those worries 
make the alarm, the original pain worse, which of course makes the worries worse, which of course makes the alarm worse. So you get caught in this alarm anxiety cycle. So that once I figured that out and started dealing with the alarm directly in my body, then I really started to heal. Wow. Thank you for sharing. There's a lot that you have shared there. And I really, really appreciate that. Because um, one of the things that for myself, working with neurodiverse students, one of the things I truly believe we need to get the child's anxiety down before they can engage in learning. And many yeah. of my children bring trauma to the classroom, you know, previous Absolutely. experiences. And But I also deeply believe that neurodiverse children pick up on our anxiety. So if the educator is not calm, the child can't be calm. So I see this conversation for my listeners is sort of twofold, whether they're a parent or an educator, how do they get their own anxiety under control? And then I believe through understanding anxiety, you can support children, if that makes sense. It totally does. And it's not just the neurodiverse kids that pick it up. Like it's, it's the, you know, regular kids, whatever they are. But I think neurodiverse kids are more sensitive in general. That's why they're neurodiverse. So, so not only are they more sensitive to their own anxiety, they're more, more sensitive to the parents' anxiety. Cause a lot of people will, will say, they, they contact me and say, can you work with my 12 year old? And it's like, well, you know what? I'll probably work with you first. You know, we have this TV show over in North America called The Dog Whisperer with Cesar Milano. And basically what he does is he goes out to different parts of the country with these problem dogs and he winds up working with the owners. And once he works with the owners, the the problem in the dog disappears. Surprise. I love that. And it's so true. It's so true. So. So just what have you found works? Like in your book, I know you're going to it in detail and I'd recommend people read it, but give us the tips. What can we put in place? Okay, the short version. Um, This is what I believe what happens. And this is how I, I believe that we fix it. So when you're a child and you experience a trauma that's too much for your little mind to bear, and that's, of course, neurodiverse kids are a lot more sensitive in this regard. What happens is that we can't hold that as children in our conscious mind. So it gets stuffed down into the unconscious. So the unconscious is actually a a manifestation of the body or the body is a manifestation of the unconscious mind. They work together. So I can find what I do with people is I find their alarm or their anxiety, whatever you want to call it, in their body. So I worked with a a woman this morning and she had this overbearing mother and she holds her alarm in her throat because she was never able to express to her mother, hey, stop doing this. I don't want this anymore. So she holds a ton of alarm in her throat. So what we did was we got her to lovingly and compassionately put her hand over this alarm in her throat and talk to that seven-year-old girl who got yelled at, who was never enough who Mm -hmm. could never wear the right thing to school or never got the good grades. It's like, hey, can we talk to this younger version of yourself? Now we're jumping right in here, as you said, because normally I take a little while, but basically it's find the alarm in your body. And when you find the alarm in the body, treat that alarm like it is your younger wounded self, because it probably is. It's probably a younger version of you that's in pain still, And while you're trying to do all these other things, like fix the thoughts of your mind, this child is still inside of you wanting help, wanting to be seen, heard, protected, and loved. And when you start doing that, when you start seeing, hearing, protecting, and loving the younger version of yourself that's still in you as alarm, then you start healing the root cause of the anxiety in the first place, rather than just trying to fix the thoughts. 100%, 100%. So Once um, you've um, identified that, and um, I would love people really nearly to pause the podcast and and take a moment and find their anxiety, because I think um, I I did this after listening to you on on the Mel Robbins podcast, and I found it invaluable, um, you know, because I think we tend to notice the anxiety, but don't really know what to do with it. And I think what you're giving us permission is to find it in our body. And then yeah. identify it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so once the person's identified that, what can they do with that? I think it's really like treating that sensation like it's it's a child. Mm. You know, so if if you were in the say the supermarket or the grocery store and a child had lost their parents and they had come up to you in tears holding their arms up, like, can you pick me up? I'm scared, I've lost my parents, of course you would pick them up. 
right? But we won't do that for ourselves because inside of us, there is also a child with their hands up saying, pick me up, hold me, connect with me. And the reason why we don't is because the child in us holds our pain. Mm -hmm. So the adult in us doesn't want to go back and revisit that child's pain. So they push the child aside. And the, ch and the child, when you get pushed aside, just gets more and more alarmed. So that's a strategy that just doesn't work. So the, the adult in us doesn't want to go back and pick up that child. And the child in us doesn't trust the adult to come back and save us because they've left us for so long. So that's the paradox. That's, the, that's what we have to start looking at is can you find this in your system? And quickly, you know, what I do is I get people to relax, you know, close your eyes, feel your feet on the floor, feel your butt in the chair, relax your shoulders, relax your jaw, and then just bring to mind a time in your life that was difficult for you. Like don't pick the worst trauma of your life, but pick a time that was difficult for you and just quietly go inside. And just see in your body where that lights up. For me, it's kind of in my solar plexus area where my ribs meet in the front. And there's there's a there's a, an ache, a pressure, a pain. It radiates up into my heart. It goes into my back. Um, there's a real sense of, of alarm, a sensation that's there. And that's a representation of the unconscious mind. It's a representation of the trauma that got buried in my unconscious by my child when I was younger. And if I can find that alarm, I can reverse engineer that and go back and get into the same room in the unconscious where that trauma, where that program is stored, and then we can start changing it. What I believe the trouble is with most psychotherapies is they try and talk consciously to this unconscious part of us. So you're kind of speaking two different languages. The unconscious is the language of the body. And the conscious is the language of the mind, what we speak in words. So the unconscious, that that child in us doesn't really understand words very well. It's more feelings. It's more emotions. And that's why I say, put your hand over that area. Really develop a compassionate, warm connection with that feeling. And then often the connection that you create with this younger version of yourself will start to expand. When you start showing that child that you are actually there for them, that you will never leave them again, then they can start trusting again. Because a lot of times with trauma is the child learns to stop trusting the world because the people that are in charge of looking after them aren't doing their job. Yeah, 100%. And I think for many of our children, this is where we sometimes have to be that guidance and aware by their behavior. Their behavior is telling us that they aren't having their needs met. And one of my biggest frustrations in schools today for neurodiverse children is where they sit the children out to reflect on their behaviour. And most of my children have no idea why they're feeling or what's going on. And, in fact, that creates more trauma because yeah. they feel many of my children in a behaviour situation need reassurance, which is what you're saying they need. Thank they you. need When a child is anxious, they don't need to be sat out. They need to be oh. actually given that reassurance. And some of my children who it, it might not even want me close, but just knowing I'm nearby when they need me, um, it might be giving them a favourite toy or activity that, that shows a sort of that... I'm here for you. If my children can't communicate, I can give them something I know they love and that that will create the connection. But by me handing it to them, I'm creating the 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 narrative that I'm here. I see you. I understand you. Yeah. That's exactly right. So like, I think the kids respond to your actions more than your words because they're already in an alarm state. And if you look at neurophysiology, when we go into that survival state, we start secreting epinephrine, we start secreting cortisol in our system, both of which kind of paralyze the thinking part of our brain and drive us deeper into emotion. So when we're trying to talk to a child, the, the part of their brain that would actually understand what we're saying has been shut off. So what they will understand at that point, because you're into the emotional realm, is emotion, like handing them something, maybe putting your hand on their back if they're not too you know, sensitive towards touch, like showing them emotionally and tone of voice, prosody of voice. It's not so much what you say. It's the volume. It's, it's the way you say it. It's the warmth in your voice. That's what they'll hear because they're already tuned into an emotional framework rather than a cognitive one. 
hundred percent. And I, I truly believe that for neurodiverse children, when they are in that survival mode, they've lost cognitive function. So, oh and so I always call it your words matter. And the yeah. words and actions that you use are, are what's really important. And I actually call it being a GPS. Like your GPS okay. just yeah. uses that calm, monotone voice. It doesn't use words like no. It yeah. <laughs> just calmly tells you what to do. If you do the wrong thing, your GPS doesn't react. If you GP, yeah. if you if you GP, you know, if you can swear at your GPS and it stays calm. And for my oppositional children, they're going to start swearing. They're going to start, yeah. and you just need to be that calm, you know, duck really going across the water and yep. being there because all you have to do is get a little bit anxious in your voice, and the children, even though they've lost cognitive function, they will pick up on that slight tremor in in your voice or your change of posture because they're in defense mode. Especially neurodiverse kids, mm. especially them, because wow. they 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 have they rely on that that as as a framework for how do I behave. It, it's almost like you know they're uh, uh, I've heard this recorded somewhere. It's like they're a turtle without a shell and a bramble patch, right? <laughs> I've never heard that, but I love it. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember. I would love to to have the author, but. But it's like that. It's like they are very sensitive. They don't have that ability that we have as adults or quote unquote normal children have of kind of going, okay, this is context. I understand that this is the context. They don't have that. So so they feel everything. Right? So, so, so they're very sensitive to any kind of thing that may actually send them back into, you know, fight or flight sympathetic activation again. Absolutely. So... I, I know and I really would love people to read the book because I think it'll be especially like we've got a lot of teachers leaving teaching in this part of the yeah. world at the moment post-COVID and I, I think do. for teachers to manage their own anxiety and I think a, a, it will all help, so help the students. So I think the book's double-edged. But um, can you talk through what we can do like personally and for the children? What solutions can we put in place to once we see the person in that survival mode? Yeah. I mean, I think touch is so important. And, 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 you know, these days, I'm sure it's the same in Australia, but you know, you can't touch kids anymore. Mm. You know, there's all there's all these things and, and there's all these barriers to touch now and touch is such a, a, a valuable sense, especially for neuro, neurodiverse kids, it can send them overboard too, because it's too intense. But it's also a very powerful way of connecting. And one of the ways that, um, that I get parents to connect to their kids is to put their hand over their child's heart and then put their other hand on their back so that their, their hands are kind of encircling the child's heart and just stay there. Just be calm, just be connected. Some kids, you know, have a hard time with this. And if, if that's the case, then you, you know, got to try something else, but it's, it's really effective to calm kids down. Just that sense of touch is really, mm. really important some some kids respond really well to essential oils like chamomile or lavender or something like that because if you look at the neurophysiology of smell smell is one is the only sense that isn't sort of pre-packaged or pre-processed by this nucleus in the brain called the thalamus and it goes directly into the emotional part of your brain so if your child has a smell that they really like like an oil that they really like have them carry around a little bottle of that because that can be very grounding and very centering as well. So it, it really, it, it depends on the child, really, it, it, the, the approach that you take. Absolutely. And with the smelling, I've done that where I just have it on like a little um, cloth, the smell the child loves so that they can just like a handkerchief, old fashioned sort of handkerchief, but the smells on there and they can just take it out and smell it. And many of our children, when they're neurodiverse children, when they're in survival mode, they will seek out sensory input. Like some of my children will start leaning on adults and, you know, and this whole not being allowed to touch. What I say is just write it in the program as long as it's in their individual program. So um, I've, I get from um, these little wooden hand massages that many of my children yeah. love that I ask that like rubbing on their back and some of my children like more of a repetitive circular motion I've found over the years that can be very soothing because some of my children actually seek out that repetitive movement. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I find is looking what that child uses to self-soothe and then what can I do 
because sometimes when they're heading for that final stage of the meltdown, I need to actually give them that soothing and that ob- observing. You know, like some children like a dark space, some children yeah. like being rolled up or in those lycra stockings. And all of when you think about it, like some of my kids, particularly my children who are non-speaking, like deep pressure when they're in the yeah. second phase. And what you're offering is that connected deep pressure. Um, and I found over the years, if I roll the children up in a gym mat and then squeeze yeah. the outside of the gym mat, um, yeah. that they do that. But what I've learned over the years, you've got to try all those things when they're calm. Exactly. not suddenly start experimenting yep. in the moment. You haven't got a lot of time in a meltdown, but, you know, yep. really looking at those senses like the smell, the physical, and, you know, acknowledging that touch is so powerful. But um, mm-hmm. on the Mel Robbins podcast, you are talking about getting you to touch yourself, and I've done this three or four times yep. since I listened to the podcast, finding a spot in your body that you can't feel anxiety and I think, can you just talk us through that? Because I've got, I think this would be invaluable for some of my adults and children. Yeah, I think it's just finding a place that's safe. You know, so often we don't pay any attention to our body until we feel alarmed, until mm. we get, you know, anxious. And often I'll tell people, it's like, where do you, like when you're feeling good, how does your body feel? And a lot of my people will say, I I don't really pay much attention to my body. It's like, yeah, that's one of the reasons why you're anxious because your, you know, your mind and your body are disconnected. That's why things like yoga and Tai Chi and dance, you know, anything that allows that movement to come in, not only are you stimulating the, the somatosensory cortex in the brain and the premotor area that can be very grounding and sensory provoking, you're also, you know, connecting the mind and the body together. And a lot of what happens with anxiety is we go, we go head up. Like we just, we start ruminating in our mind over and over. So if there's a place on your body that, that feels, you know, alarmed, you know, doing circles over that with your palm, you know, breathing into that area, just really focusing on it in this just very compassionate, kind, slow way. And often I get people to do that when they're not in a, in the, in the throw of, of anxiety and 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 practice it before and the little thing that i i've said on numerous podcasts is you know if i said hey sue i'm going to take you down to the basketball court in three months and i'm going to get you to shoot 10 foul shots and if you make three of them i'm going to give you five million dollars are you going to start practicing foul shots the day before it's like no you're going to go out every day and practice so that when it comes up when that day comes up you're going to make three out of those 10 foul shots so it's the same kind of thing but i noticed with a lot of anxious people they if they're feeling okay they just want to ignore it they just want to pretend they don't even have an anxiety issue they just they don't want to go into it so it's really important to practice when you're feeling good and get really adept at how does my body feel when I'm feeling good? The other thing that I'll do with people, and I did it this morning with my my little anxiety peep that I work with this morning is what was the best time in your life? Yeah. What was the very best time in your life? You know, and, and um, you know, pick a time that, you know, you were start, first started dating your, your spouse or, um, the birth of the first child a, a tense one because there's a, a <laughs> no I promise like, you Dr. Ross that's yeah. not in my high list exactly. of things I'm, exactly. I'm thinking more a favorite beach than a first yeah. child birth. that kind of stuff you know like find yeah. that like really and go into it in your mind's eye as deeply as you can and then see if there's a sensation in your body that correlates with that you know because mm-hmm. often what I'll do is I'll get people to find where the alarm is like this morning the person had it in their throat and then they felt this sort of warm sensation when they thought about meeting their husband you know oh. uh, kind of lower in their and and what I did was I got them to go back and forth between the two I love so, it so you know let's let's bring up this this feeling of alarm let's let's bring up your mom you know phoning cuz her, her mother phoned and said I'm coming to visit it's like okay. <laughs> so automatically her throat just right up it's like okay. i'm feeling like okay. i should play this before christmas because a yeah. lot of people will be having oh. that anxiety before the family or visit you know christmas in australia is really big it's like your th- thanksgiving for people in america it's a bit out of control so yeah yeah i feel so, like maybe i should put it on before maybe 
So because it it really in, in in somatic experience they call it pendulation. In other therapies they call it oscillation. But it's basically taking a negative experience and blending it with a positive one. Yeah. And by the same token, taking a positive experience and blending it with the negative one, because it tends to take a lot of the edge off the negative experience. And it tends to take to, to allow you to stay grounded and centered while you're in that negative experience, as opposed to just going off. And I and, love and that. So of, I, yeah. I'm just, my mind's going everywhere at the moment. One okay. of the thoughts I'm just having for my neurodiverse children who are on the autism spectrum, yep. they normally have a passion or something that brings them joy. It might be yep. their trains. It might be sensory like bubbles. So yep. it's actually very easy for adults to identify what brings that child joy. In fact, the, the, most of my children, that's the first thing they'll, you know, I always say, stand back and watch. What do they do if left alone? That is their right. joyful place. And in fact, I believe these children are very honest about what brings them joy compared totally. to the rest of us. Like totally. um, yeah. this year, one of my questions for the whole of 2022, I've been asking people, what brings you joy? And you'll be amazed how many adults have no idea. Yep. Like they get, oh, I've no idea. But I can assure you, children on the autism spectrum are up front. Their favourite DVD, Sing, or they love Minecraft. They, they don't even have to think. They are yep. so fast at knowing what brings them joy. So nice. for us, it, as educators, we can use that. So if we know that is something that brings them joy, we can have that, what I'm hearing is we can have photos or have that activity so we can do that joyful thing. And then... We, we also know what makes them anxious pretty quickly. And yeah. we can practice, like you say, the basketball going between the two. Um, yeah. So I don't think that's that hard um, to establish that joyful things. And I normally like to have what I call a bad day box, which is filled with all those things. Like if I know a child loves Star Wars, my bad, you know, I don't call it the bad day box, so you're going to have it. But if you I know should. I'm going to be away, here's all the activities for this child, you know. All Star Wars, all Minecraft, or whatever they love, right. right? But because I know there's a stranger in the room, so there's the trigger, there's the anxiety, right. that, the, hey, there's someone different. So I've got the antidote, here's the box of things. But I'm hearing Thanks. I've intuitively worked that out. And I suppose I've never expressed it that way before, but you're making my mind go, ah, that's why that works. You should Make- mark that in, market that in Australia. You'd you'd make a million dollars suit the the bad day box, you know, <laughs> for adults. You know, throw in stuff. Some people in, are gonna need it on Christmas Day, but most Australians leave that would have alcohol in that box. We're terrible, you know. Whatever, whatever works, whatever <laughs> works. But again, like what you're saying is like, but the 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 stuff that you you know, show them and help them with once they start heading down that road of of overwhelm and that sort of stuff. Doesn't matter if you show them the thing that they're 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 yeah. most in love with. Like once they've got past a a certain critical mm-hmm. point, you know. So that's why I love your idea about like you know taking them slowly into like having some a stranger come in or whatever, and then have the bad day box there. It's like have them sort of go back and forth between the two and then have the stranger leave. You know, that kind of stuff is like basically you're kind of retraining their unconscious nervous system that they don't always have to go down that negative path. I call it the highway to hell, but I wouldn't say that to a kid. Yeah, like, oh, don't what? worry. I work with enough children who would tell me that, Dr. Rouse. Okay. I, I work with oppositional children who would tell me I'm the highway to hell. So that's yeah. all right. <laughs> but once you, you know, once you're like half a kilometer down the highway of hell, there's no way back. Not nah. you know. So you have 100%. to get them at the at the 200 meter mark. You know, exactly. when you start seeing them starting to go in that direction, that's when you got to get in there. And that's what's so hard because, you know, parenting or teaching, like, it's just so hard to, you know, keep that level of attention to all these kids, you know, at once. And, and you know, it's it's, it's a job that I would, you know, I, teaching would be almost like an impossible job for me. I can deal with one person. I can deal with one person. I'm good, but if I have to deal with more than two or three people at a time, my own ADD will go off the off the charts. Absolutely. Which sort of what you're saying about once a child goes down that path and bringing back the basketball analogy. One of the things I call emotional regulation, emotional literacy. We when we teach children to read, you know, teachers we start off with learning the alphabet, we then we move right. towards words and letters and we use visuals to support reading like early books are short, they're 
got pictures in them. And I think what we need to teach children is emotional literacy. And that's yeah. understanding where anger feels in their body, where anxiety, understanding their body. And I normally draw a picture of the body and ask them where they feel it. And then we work through that. And then we work through what we can do when we feel that way. But you don't just do it once off. It's that yeah. we don't just read once off. We read every day. Yeah. Emotional literacy has to be a daily task because every day when I'm reading, I read a word I don't know. Every day in my life, I experience an emotion I don't know. You know, um, different emotions come up. Some you know, some you don't know. So I, I am a true believer in emotional literacy, which it sounds sort of like we're on the same page with this stuff. Well, there there is some evidence um, that the more words, ad, this is for adults, you know, yeah. the more words, emotion words that an adult knows, the more emotionally literate they are. So, yeah. so I often thought a, a fantastic app would be, you know, ha- asking something like, what's the difference between grief and sadness and, and having people actually in their mind going, okay, well, grief is usually something that's happened. That's you've had a loss of some kind. Sadness can be just like, you're just unhappy about something, you know, just when you drill down to the nuances of what these words mean, it does seem like the people that know more emotion words seem to be a more emotionally literate, which makes sense from a neuroscience pr- perspective, because you can, the words are, are very specific to, to their own meaning. So if you can, the more words, you know, the more nuanced words, you know, the more expression you can have using and knowing those words. And, and I think it, it's just a fascinating thing that I, I ran across the other day is like the more emotion words people know, the more emotionally literate they tend to be. It 100% makes sense because yeah. what when I do emotional literacy for children or emotional regulation, I always like brainstorm what words yeah. do you know? And my young children often only know sad, yeah. angry, happy. That's it. You know, some adults only know sad, <laughs> angry, happy. So it's so, just like, so I love, I love doing yeah. that with them. And, yeah. and one of the things, cause this is such a selfie generation. I love getting all the kids to like line up, like do a happy say, face, a sad face, yeah. you know, angry. And then we go like take photos and then they have to identify because emotional literacy, I think it's not only understanding your own emotions, it's understanding others and yeah. that two way um, literacy, like reading and comprehension. And oh. um. I, I love it with children when they can then sort of start to get interested in emotions, you know, like fascinating. Oh, look, oh, yeah. what's that face? You know, yeah. and they want to tell me things like, oh, Sue, I felt this, this like sudden rage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's so much, especially with neurodiverse kids, is they they're so inside of themselves, mm. you know. When we teach them how to go outside of themselves, it's really quite liberating for them, you know, because they don't they don't tend to read other people very well. Mm. Right. So and but they want to. I think all human beings have this desire to learn and understand. And I think the more, you know, you bring them into that kind of feeling, oh, this is what this other person may be feeling. Okay, And then they they feel more connected to that person. And the more connection they have, the more settled they are. Absolutely. I don't know if you've seen Love on the Spectrum over on so. Netflix. Oh, it's a fantastic series about people on the spectrum wanting to get a boyfriend or girlfriend. And okay. it follows that journey. And um, in Australia, Jody Rogers, who was a sex therapist for them, um, came on my podcast. And it was just fascinating because, again, yeah. that is all about wanting connection understanding yep. your own emotions, someone else's, but all of these young people are desperate for relationships, desperate yeah. to have that connection. And unfortunately, because of autism, previous, you know, TV shows and stuff often didn't show that need for connection um, right. and affection. And so Love on the Spectrum is a really good show okay. to change the thinking. I think they've done an English and American one now, but it's it's a great insight into what we're talking about. And also a reminder why it's important to teach these skills, because yeah. actually for all of them, when they're going on that first day, anxiety. Oh, yeah. How do they, how do they manage that, you know? Yeah. 
I mean, we have something called the social engagement system. It's often called the human resonance circuitry too, which is basically eye contact, tone of voice, prosody of voice, facial expression, and body language. It's, you know, if you're out for lunch with a good friend and you're laughing and you guys are getting a lot, you know, there's that, that bond that you just feel like this, just the connection that you just feel. And it makes it easy. It makes social interaction very easy. But when we get alarmed, we shut off that social engagement system from an evolutionary perspective, because, you know, thousands of years ago, if we were being chased by a warring tribe, we didn't need to be connected and focused on each other. We just needed to escape. So the poor people with with autism or or social anxiety, that social engagement system is actually shut off. It's preferentially moved into the survival state. So if you don't have the software to be able to to be able to understand someone's gaze, understand their facial expression, understand their body language. Of course, you're not going to want to go into a party. Of course, no. you're not going to go into a situ a social situation because you're not equipped for that mm -hmm. particular thing. Like if someone asked me, you know, hey, I want uh, we, we've got somebody on your, my team that didn't show up for curling. Can you show up? Can you go and curl? It's like, well, I don't want to do that because I've never curled before and I'm horrible at it. But if someone said, hey, you know, we're having a softball game on the weekend and one of our players, I'd be right in there because I, you know. Exactly. I, I right. it, it's funny, Dr. Russ. Um, a lot of people call uh, it a social skills group. Imagine wanting to go to a social skills group when social is your anxiety. Exactly. I prefer yeah. it's like a Lego club or a Star Wars yeah. club or a Comic-Con. I mean, yeah. Comic-Con, people on the spectrum are happy to go to that. They get dressed oh, up course. and go along, meet like-minded people. But imagine, it's like you're curling. Imagine being told, oh, we're going to set up a social skills club. It's like, that's yeah, what I'm worse at. Why would I yeah. choose? <laughs> it's almost like, uh, you know, doctors. You know, I was a doctor for many years in, in the hospitals and that kind of stuff. It's, it's like, and doctors were all burned out. You know, they're all yeah. frustrated. They're all burned out. And it was like, if, but if you put up a sign, you know, like doctor support group today, nobody would go. None no. of the doctors would go. Like they wouldn't show up. I don't need that. I'm fine. You know? <laughs> it's, it's just funny how we resist what we need the most. You know? uh, so true. So true. Now, I really appreciate I told you this wouldn't take up too much of your time. I know how precious it is. So I will finish off. But is there any last little gems you want to share with us before? Well, there's two things. I mean, I think the big thing about anxiety is that it's really alarm. So I would love it if people would stop saying I'm feeling anxious and just say I feel alarmed. Because if you're with somebody, they'll understand because everybody's felt alarm, not everybody's felt anxious. So that's one thing. The other thing is that when you are feeling alarmed in your system is is just see if you can find localize it. And then see if you can just sit with it as opposed to and watch your mind's compulsive, relentless um, seduction to try and seduce you into thinking, which basically causes most of the problem. So if you can sit with the alarm feeling, find it in your body, put your hand over it, connect with it. Like if you can sit with that alarm feeling without adding thoughts to it, you're actually leading yourself on the path to healing. What, what creates anxiety and what's, what makes it worse is that we think, we believe there's some part of us that thinks that we can think our way out of this feeling problem. And we keep trying to think and think and think like if I think if I just if I could just get the answer and basically you're just creating more of the problem. So the, the thing that I give people all the time is saying, look, if you can feel the alarm, see if you can just stay with that alarm and treat it as your younger wounded self rather than trying to go up and fix it in your mind because you're not going to find the solution in your mind. I often say it's kind of like looking for peanut butter in the hardware store. You're not going <laughs> to find it there. It's not going to be there. I love that. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruth. This has been amazing. I highly recommend everyone reads your book and congratulations. It's fantastic. And um, and also your Instagram, that's probably the best place that they'll find. Yeah, more. probably the best place to find the anxiety. All my stuff is the anxiety MD, the anxiety MD.com, the anxiety MD, not the anxiety doctor, the anxiety MD. So okay. that's how that's how to find me. I really appreciate it. And Really appreciate you sharing your so much wealth of information. And I know if people follow you, it's just going to keep their anxiety on uh, on track and also the, the kids that they love and support. Yeah. And that's my goal too, just, you know, to, to have people not have to suffer with anxiety the way that I did.
No, oh, I love that. It's a beautiful note to finish on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. I hope you've got some great tips and strategies to make a difference. Remember, strategies wear out and not every strategy works for everybody. If you're ready to dive in deeper to more strategies and ideas to make a difference, I'd highly recommend you consider Dr. Tony Atwood or my online courses. For more information, visit my website, www.sulaki.com.au.